<laughs> okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Good morning. Nice to see all of you there <laughs> at this early time on Sunday. Well, we're just starting with this screen. The comment you see here is from a teacher in America saying, hey guys, what you're doing is absolutely illegal. It can't be true that software is free. And that's why we do this one. <laughs> Just to tell you, we are doing free software and yes, we want to tell children about it. We want the children uses free software and something somebody told me it's good to use free software and to free your mind. Okay. My fault, sorry. <laughs> okay, sorry. Good morning. I'm Andrea Florio, also known as Anubis G1 in... I turned it off, whoa! Okay. Also known as Anubis G1 by the OpenSUSE community. And uh, here my mail. I am a pack gun packager since uh, 2007 and uh, I'm proud to join the, uh, the education project last year. Uh, I started as a, a normal packager, but later, uh, thanks to Lars, I, I became the, uh, one of the four administrators. Right now, I maintain several packages in uh, our repository. Uh, I lost the counts, really. <laughs> and uh, um, my job uh, is uh, the technology teacher in the QSI International School. Uh, that is um, a school international where uh, sons of uh, United Nations employees uh, uh, go on, uh, on several states. He is Lars Vogot and he can talk. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Welcome, my name is Lars Vogt. I'm formerly known as Lars Rupp and my nickname is Kleiner Eisbär. It's a special name for the Germans under us. And um, currently I'm working for the auto build or distribution team for SUSE and uh, joined the education team around 2006 before I worked on a special product called SUSE School Server and uh, therefore I have some knowledge about the education thing. I'm currently maintaining around 250 packages in the education repository and as you might see, that's far too much. And I hope I can give away some of those packages to the upstream developers in the near future. Okay, we so that's our goals. The main goal is, wherewith do you teach tomorrow? Yeah. The first goal and currently the main goal is to get OpenSUSE in schools and to support those schools using OpenSUSE and help them to get it spread around all pupils. Of course, we want to provide the best integration between OpenSUSE and our application for both server and desktop. Why that's uh, uh, why uh, for us uh, clients are important like servers because without them uh, we can't provide uh, a good environment in schools. You know, lots of schools work uh, using Active Directory and we think that we can completely ch uh, substitute Active Directory with open source uh, uh, education. That's why we provide both. We also try to contribute to uh, improve open source. That's uh, uh, why Lars told uh, that uh, Hopefully, we can send uh, upstream our packages. What else? You can see here two, uh, two goals 
half green and half blue. The that goals are still a kind of work in progress. In fact, uh, uh, we will try to build a cross-distribution education community, but it's not really easy right now. The same work uh, is uh, the same thing is to work uh, together with the developers, uh, even if we, um, we have uh, uh, some examples like uh, Salome developers and Tuxpint ones and lots of others. Uh, what else? Last, last point, support home users means if anybody of you has a kid, perhaps you might know what's the critical aspects letting kids working alone on your PC and that's one other task we have. One is to work for schools and get educational applications in schools. Another one is to help home users with their kids so they can even use the same applications. It's really simple. Or even get something like a filter software for Firefox and so on. What does we have right now? We have a very, very big project and is growing day by day. We have something like 800 packages for both, x32 uh, and 74 bits. We released the 1.0 add-on for OpenSUSE 10.2, 10.3, 11.0 and 11.1, and also for SUSE Linux Enterprise, uh, for SUSE Linux Enterprise 10, sorry. We provide on our wiki description for not all the software right now, but we are working to do that for lots of them anyway. We have our Bugzilla, uh, and we have to say thanks to Novell for providing us that. We have uh, an SF1 repository, a developer wiki, and uh, our own page. You can see some URL on the bottom of the page. And we have also maybe the most important things, two repositories, the developer one and the frozen one. There are two, uh, why? Simply because uh, uh, one is intended for end user, the other one, of course not. Let's see why. The build service repository, uh, I, we wrote as developer one, is not for end user. We can't add a license dialog. We can write everything on that license dialog, but we can't add into the build service repository. No yes features. We can't add control files, we can't add package translations and everything else. We tried to install all education software using the standard control file provided by the OpenSUSE DVD and simply doesn't fit. So using the build server repository, we can't work with it. It's not available without an internet access because uh, uh, as, you know a single package uh, sometimes uh, trigger several packages to rebuild. So you need uh, an internet uh, access to download uh, anytime the latest package. No. Um, to enhance the, the third point, it's not available with all internet access means at least if you have schools with 50, 60, 100 PCs, you don't want each PC to connect directly to the internet to get all the packages. That's one point why we release an add-on ISO image so people can just burn it on the DVD and use this DVD instead of connecting each PC to the internet. Yeah. Okay, next point. Zipper add repository as non-refresh. Well, yes, it's uh, simple. Just use the command line tool zipper and add the OpenSUSE build service education repository. You will notice that Zipper adds this repository with a marking non-refresh. So what can happen? You try to install one package one or two hours later and in this time the build service rebuilds the whole repository. The package Zipper has in the cache is version 1.0 and release 35. No, the build service has rebuilt the complete repository. Zipper has the cached repository and says, hey, I want release 35. But the build service has 36. And that's when Zipper tells you, sorry, this package is not available. Refresh means download at least the metadata. 
If, even if you have an internet connection to refresh all the time, you have to download at least four megas. So it's a waste of time, it's a waste of internet uh, bandwidth and everything. No end user information. Why a package has an Iger version or release number? This is maybe one of the most important points. In fact, on uh, using a build service repository, we can't provide information before, uh, so before install a, a package. Okay, you can have information only after you install that, reading the package change log. That uh, is not a good thing. You know, you want to know what uh, we change we made before install a new version. Packages can be broken during testing. You know, that's a, develop a development repository. We aptly change, we aptly patch, and uh, sometimes packages are broken. And even if a test is uh, any always welcome, an end user don't care about broken repository. Otherwise, he wants only stable one. Wait, wait, wait. So, no, one Sorry. second, please. <laughs> okay, that's our reasons for using the build service for developers and for testers. That's our reasons at the moment why we can't use the build service for end users. And hopefully in the next future of the build service releases all these topics will be gone. But until then we stay with this seven points to tell people if you want stable packages, if you want packages that just work, please use of frozen repositories. So, this is a short overview how we work at the moment. I have this one? Yep. So, on this side, you see what we as developers do. It's just simply the same process every developer knows. We get the sources, put them in the build service, the build service builds the package, hopefully, and afterwards we can test the package. We have additional testers around the world testing packages from the build service repository and add Baxilla entries to our Baxilla. Afterwards, we can just restart the process, fixing the packages, rebuilding them, testing them again, and so on and so on. So at the moment, once a time when we decide that we are in a stable enough state, we say, okay, now it's a time to create a frozen repository ready to use for end users. And that's when we begin to sync the build service repository outside. We start just putting down the packages on a separate server and re-sign them with our own GPG key to make it clear that this package has nothing to do with the original build service. It just has another GPG key, it has another signing. If you test such a package in the frozen repository, you will notice that these packages are already signed with the GPG key from the OpenSUSE education team and not with the build service one. Another one is Building this repository enables us to use all the Yast features. So if you add this repository, you get a license dialog that tells you how you can reach us, how you can talk to us, how you can add Baxilla entries and so on. If you enable this repository, you have pattern files, which means a group of packages which are useful for small kids, for bigger kids, for really universities and so on, and even for servers. And that's why we use this step to sync the packages outside of the build service repository. And well, it's a called beep happens. And uh, sometimes always packages in this frozen repository are broken. <laughs> well, the same is for every distribution, I think. And for this case, we have also a frozen, let's call it frozen, it's just outside of the build service update repository. So if we detect a broken package in this frozen repository, we are already have enabled and installed 
an update repository in your zipper. If you install the frozen repository and look at zipper, you will get an additional update repository which is per default disabled. Because if you have a school with 60 or more PCs, you don't want even to search for updates in this repository. That's the reason why it is disabled per default. But if you enable it, you can get updates for these packages in the frozen repository. And these updates are coming, for example, with patch infos, so you can see before you install a package what has changed. And uh, of course, we don't have to forget our community. In fact, using mailing list, IRCH, and, uh, the, we, uh, and the debugzilla wiki request, we can uh, have all the information we need to provide new packages to fix the bugs uh, we can find. And everything works with uh, our bugzilla. Everything will be moved there. Without it, our work is very, very difficult. So our community is maybe the, the core of, uh, of our work, of our team. Without it, we can't work. We have, we've talked here, mailing lists, ERG, forums, and so on, all your possibilities where you can talk to people outside, talk to the community, and often the community tells us, hey, I want this package, or this package could be a better package, or so on. And to not get lost this information, we currently just use Baxilla, so we have, for example, an own wish list in our Baxilla, so people can just add new package wishes. Going on. Okay. Well, we talked about that, about that yet, but uh, we can review again. As so we have update and frozen repository. But uh, what are benefits? Using a frozen repository, you don't need to refresh it. It's frozen. We follow the same policy as uh, open source repository. We have a frozen one and an updated one. The first one is not need to be refreshed. It's well tested and, and, uh, sta and packages are stable. Is full, we have one GPG key that can fully control everything and is an add-on media. We, can, we provide an ISO and, we, and everything starts automatically. It's, uh, it's easy and easier to document. We in fact uh, uh, usually provide uh, uh, documentation about uh, the most important packages uh, with the, the repository and uh, the ISO image. And it's easier to file bug reports because you know exactly which version, which release of a package uh, is buggy. Using the, bug, uh, the um, open source build service repository, you know the package is built anytime and maybe you file a bug report that has been fixed on the, the next release. Using the update repository instead, uh, yes, is uh, added automatically and uh, is not uh, refreshed, uh, uh, is not set as auto refresh. You have to enable it. But uh, most important things, as uh, as we told before, is uh, it contains patch infos. You see in the uh, open source update wraplet what kind of change has been made on the package. If you agree with that change, you can install the package. It is something you can compare before the, the installation. And it's really smaller than the, the main repository. It's just, we saw the metadata and it was just uh, 150 kilobits. So it's Again, definitely it's 4 megabit for the whole repository. OK. Well, <laughs> we have to say thanks to lots of people, starting from OpenSUSE, Nouvelle, my Linux user, Brooke, with the group, the Linux, uh, the Brilog, sorry, XTS, Tux for my Tux for kids, and Didasca is an Italian group uh, that provide uh, that provide open source, uh, uh, sorry, open source ACDL, and all the others which have no logo, of <laughs> course. <laughs> oh, like, well, I can't like find it. <laughs> like, like communities and our developers and so on. But if you can see at this slide. What we want to do is to try to work together with Upstream, work together with other partners to get OpenSUSE education spread around the world. Yep. 
That's why HP and Novell started a, uh, an education project. And uh, last week, maybe, they, they, they fired news uh, telling uh, thanks to us for our work. They, and Novell looks like, uh, looks like that uh, would uh, to work together with us to improve our packages and uh, provide uh, any time a best uh, and better uh, add-on media for education. Just, just for the information, currently we have around 20 packagers alone in the Education Build Service Repository, which does not mean that these are all. We have many more people around the world yeah. starting testing. By testing, they are helping us or helping people with their packages. So if you look at the forums and search for education, you find many, many requests about packages for the application repository and already people in the forums helping each other to get this running. And uh, even upstream developers are now starting to work with us. So if upstream says, hey, it's a good tool, we can start something. For example, we have already packages for Fedora and some people already asked us to build also their packages, their software for Debian and Ubuntu. Uh, the only reason currently that we doesn't have such packages for Debian and Ubuntu is that we are not Debian packages at the moment and we just have to learn it. <laughs> so if somebody w is able to package uh, deb Debs, link it, okay. <laughs> join us. <laughs> great, great journey. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay. Kiwi LTSP is maybe the most important server project we are working on. And it's been awarded in uh, 2008 of uh, free open source software in India. Oh, well, what's Kiwi LTSP? Well, Kiwi LTSP is based on Linux terminal server project called LTSP5. It provides simply a way to use from the from thin clients, that means clients without an hard disk and uh, uh, without an hard disk, uh, application from the main computer. Uh, Lots of uh, terminal server or, and many thin clients. That many thin clients means also very obsolete computers in schools. Supports PXC support. They are able to PXC boot. They can boot from the, inter from the internet then. Well, we, we use also Kiwi to build the, our system PX client. We create an image of the whole operating system and um, a benefit using Kiwi is that Kiwi is widely used. It's a stable uh, resource right now. It's used with, uh, well, sorry, it's used on SUSE Studio, on build service, is integrated into Yast, is easy to add local application and going on. How does Kiwi LTS LTSP works? Simply install the, it use LTSP to send a single image, but the single image is not a single application. Is the image is the image of the whole operating system. So, thin clients, computers without an hard disk, uh, com very obsolete computers, are able to start the whole operating system with all application installed on the main computer. Right now, with a computer with uh, four gigas of RAM, right? we are able to, to boot something like uh, 30 thin clients or something like that. So, you know, with a very good PC, you can create uh, uh, a, a nice computer lab in your school with just few money. Just, just by reusing old hardware, which obsolete normally and doesn't run the current applications. And... Uh, I forget to, say, to tell that uh, uh, Kiwi LTSP is not uh, uh, limited to uh, PXC boot. You can also, thanks to Kiwi, boot using live CDs, USB images, uh, and uh, everything else you have in your mind. We also provide an integration with uh, Italk and uh, with Ice Cream to provide uh, a kind of uh, build farm. Uh, One. I mean, that's, that's one reason why we use Kiwi. It's really easy at the moment, even if there is no GUI for it. But you just have to edit some configuration files, restart the build, and 
For example, if you have an old hardware, you have, for example, a Pentium 3 or something like that, and you said, okay, running this as normal thin client without really using the processor is not really useful for me because then everything runs on the terminal server. So we can try to find a way-to-way -way solution just saying something like, okay, I integrate a Firefox in the Kiwi image. It's just by adding the package name to the configuration file, rebuild the image, and now you have a Firefox running on your local client if you start it from there. So the terminal server doesn't have to run Firefox, all the clients run Firefox. And so you can test how much your hardware works, and you can find the best solution for your setup by just adding packages which can be run locally. For example, I don't think you want to have OpenOffice run on your local client, but other apps maybe are useful for that. And we, are, we have also uh, Cyborg and uh, other developers that uh, builded a, a kind of a GUI for QLTSP uh, called Easy LTSP. It's uh, an easy configurator that allow you to set up just a few things and uh, press OK, stop, everything is working. But how can you install Kiwi LTSP? Well, the easiest way is to use the one-click install or maybe use uh, our patterns provided on our frozen repository. And uh, that's all. Install the packages, start easy LTSP, and you have to configure at least the server IP address and ADXCP range. That's are the minimal requirements for a QLTSP working. You can, of course, also add the, the packages you want to install. You can uh, uh, customize your, uh, your configuration. But that's the simple things you need to work. Once you did it, just press on OK. Uh, EasyLTSP will start the setup process, will start the TFTP server, the DXCP server, and Nothing else. You simply have to boot your thin clients from network maybe, or using uh, CDs or uh, USB sticks, and whoa, you have now your thin clients working OpenSUSE with educational software, of course. Yeah. So I think this is the time where everyone can ask questions. <laughs> yeah. No? OK, so yeah. Yes? I'm going to close here, sir. Hello, I'm, I'm the author of G-Compri, uh, yeah. software in, in education. And you, so you're talking a lot of the infrastructures that you build to deliver open source, and you didn't talk a lot about the content itself. So where are we in terms of content? Are the teacher or the school can already find everything they need uh, in uh, open source or in the free software community? Or do we still have some big uh, miss in the application stack? Yes, by the time, welcome, Bruno. <laughs> yes, um, question about applications that are there or that are missing. Um, it's not easy to answer because we have, as I told you already, over 800 packages. Gcompre is one of the things, uh, Physicash or the other applications for small kids are uh, also there. So if you like to compare uh, the OpenSUSE release and, and other releases like Fedora or Debian, we are currently at the same stage. So this is not the problem. The problem is that we need feedback from schools, from the users. That's the really reason that we have, because we can package thousands of packages if nobody uses it, or better, nobody tells us which packages are useful, it's not worth the work, no. at least. So for us, it's really nice to see as HP starts and tells us, hey, here are 40 applications. We need those 40 applications. And that's when I start to ask, why? And HP tells us, yeah, we have a marketing, and marketing tells us that people want these 40 applications. 
That's why we want to work together with other parties. Because if we can get more information about what people outside need, outside our developer brain, let's say it so, we can just easily work for them. And if I told you in the beginning that we are trying to work for home users, every time I talk to people having kids at home, they say, hey, yes, my kid wants to get a PC, but I'm not sure if the internet is the right thing for my kid. And that's where we should start thinking about why is this so and how can we solve this. And so in this process, it's, it's very important for us to get the feedback out of the community, out of our users, and start adding such feature wishes to our Baxilla to don't get them lost. So it's really important. Uh, hopefully this is answering your question or? Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. So yes, there are plans already for the next version. We are currently releasing OpenSUSE Education 1.0, which for us means at least we have all the packages that we think that are worth to have in our repository. The next version will be at least 1.1 or something like this having additional packages and the first applications developed especially for schools and for home users. So, for example, the, the Kiwi LTSP is, is one of those. As we talk to teachers, they tell us, hey, terminal servers, wow, great, wonderful, but Can I use it's it? really difficult to set up and maintain it. So, we are going closer and said, okay, how can we reach it to make it easily to be installed by people not having the, the tech knowledge background. So they just should, well, at least take these three steps and everything is up and running. So I really appreciate the Fedora success providing a an, an USB stick where you can say, okay, put it in, boot it, and your terminal server is ready. Well, okay, that's the next step. OpenSUSE will follow. <laughs> but Yes, with, with such simply, simple systems, it's, it's really easy to reach the people outside and show them that it's really easy to use and that the packages that we have are also useful for them. We have the problems that people have tons of applications but no description. And Don't know please talk with teachers. If they tell them, hey, it's a wonderful application, you can get your vocabularies learned automatically with a result at the end. They tell you, hey, where's the documentation in my language? And that's the main problem that we and I think every other project has at the moment. My company does a lot of internal training, so it's not only for schools, I would say. And, uh, I'm an application engineer. Sometimes we do training on Linux, so we get the live CD and we can't store any of the results. So that would be one of the key benefits of having a live CD, live CD that could directly connect to a server where you could generate automatically a home directory so you could retrieve the data. That would be a big benefit, I would say, if you had that type of function. Okay, thank you. That's one of the features for our Baxilla. <laughs> and mm -hmm. It's not easy, uh, not really complicated to implement because we have already such live ESOs you can put in that are booting via PXE and uh, don't touch your hard disk. So what we have to do is integrate that into the domain. Okay. We Thanks. also forget to say that uh, we provided some some month ago the first uh, educational live CD. Uh, build it using SUSE Studio and uh, allow you to try open source education without installing no, uh, stuff on, on your PCs. So, What you also could consider is also instead of storing it on the server is that you boot from the live CD and then you have a USB key as your hard disk. Yes. That would also make life a lot easier. Sure. Oh, <laughs> just give it. Okay, I think uh, uh, Debian has um, 
popularity contest, which when you sign and you say, okay, you know afterwards, Babin will collect how uh, many programs and which programs you used. I think something could give you uh, automatic feedback from your users. Just put it into the one-click install and add, okay, you may send it and uh, you get information. Yeah. One yes. suggestion. The other one is, uh, uh, I'm from old PC Switzerland, uh, do you package also sugar uh, on it? Yes, we have yes. packages for sugar, but they're currently in our development repository. <laughs> we don't say they are ready for use. Okay, but you are working on it and... Uh, yes, you can sure. test it if you want. Yeah, I, uh, I have a question about uh, your uh, uh, development model. Uh, when you um, when you are seeing your, uh, um, I mean, do you froze the the um, the build service repos okay. with the same thing we have in the frozen repositories? So if you, uh, if I look for a, an application on your build service, I, I it would be the same version as in the frozen. Yeah, kind of, kind of. We when we reach the frozen uh, the frozen state, we disable building on uh, building and sometimes also updating on the build service repository. Then we go to download everything uh, packages, all that one we consider stable enough, and then with the simple uh, bash script that uh, Lars wrote. Uh, we are able to resign everything. They are simple, the same package coming from the build service for reason of comp for compatibility reasons, sorry, because it must be built uh, using the um, open source uh, software repository and uh, stuff like that. We simply download and resign in adding on the frozen repository. Then we, we go to recreate the whole uh, repository structure using tools right, uh, like uh, create repo, and oh, the repository is, is ready for use, right? Does it? Hmm? They, sh yes, they should be the same. Is there yes. Aren't there a really big bug? Yes. Uh, do, you, do you have, um, you, you talk it about open school server, but I don't know exactly what it is. Does that relate with a school tool, the stuff that made Ubuntu to administrate uh, uh, a, a, a school laboratory or or every, all the school infrastructure, and how could we work with the application? Because many schools don't use a, don't have a, a login per user. Some have, some don't have, and uh, they want any way to get uh, or they may be interested to have feedback from the application to the user to save the data in the in the user directory, even if there is a no no login because they don't want to, so there are a lot of questions around this. I don't know if you have uh, some ideas or investigated or how can we work in this area? Well, currently we are working on a YAS model that uh, should be able to manage uh, uh, rights on uh, clients, on, on students and uh, teachers' uh, PCs. And uh, using Kiwi LTSP, you are also able to create one single user and allow login for everybody or also if your school is integrated into an Active Directory domain, uh, if you install an SSH server on the, your Windows server, you are also uh, able to log in in Kiwi LTSP using Active Directory accounts. So, um, um, one thing I have in mind, thinking about storing uh, results of tests and so on for users is something we already evaluated with a school server. Um, we have two options at all. One option is to use the LDAP. So what we have to do is patching each application to allow using LDAP and to tell the developers how to patch so it works. Another option is to use a generic database backend. And that's something the KDE developers are already working on it with their KDE Edu applications. But it's in a very, very early state. They are currently just talking about the API and so on. So it's, it's not really 
that kind of stuff that you currently can say outside users they can use it. But there are discussions about this already, but not a real solution. And um, I just want to wait until we have one or two uh, solutions which can work before we start a, a more generic discussion with our people to get these things working for all applications, hopefully. But it's, it's in the discussion, yes. Do you think that this is usable for remote education? You have a server in Stockholm and you're running your training here. <laughs> yeah. Yes, absolutely. But depending on your bandwidth. <laughs> that's, that's the reason we have already in Germany. Uh, Germany schools have normally a free internet account. But this account is very, very limited in bandwidth. So schools can download nearly everything. But if people sitting at home and trying to reach the school server, they're sitting there and saying, hey, my modem is faster. <laughs> so um, at least I think theoretically it should be possible. And I know already schools are working like this. I know at least one school in Germany have a 10 megabyte or something like that bandwidth. And uh, teachers working at home, just connecting via WebDAV to the home directories on the school server. So yes, even that's possible, but it's a point-to-point -point decision. What would you say would be the main requirement? Depends on your users. <laughs> it's, just, it's, it's not really uh, unique to say, OK, you need at least this bandwidth. Uh, depending if you want to start with video editing, or, or audio editing, uh, <laughs> don't try this. <laughs> but uh, for the normal user trying to work with open office or something like that, it's uh, really a small bandwidth, it works. But transferring the whole application or transfer making an X connection, like something like this, it's um, sometimes kind of funny. But free and X and so on already works. So I, if no other question, I think we can. OK. Can we have one question? <laughs> Sorry, our time is up. Just a single one. A couple of years ago, at the introduction of educational software, uh, you mentioned that the software, the education part, was written uh, with the Spanish language and English language. How easy is it at the, this day to translate it to other languages? Mm -hmm. well, we um, that's that's developer question. Um, We're working on a web front end to translate at least the package description and so on. Um, but translating the packages, the applications, it's, it's hopefully something we can do together with upstream. So every distribution will benefit of it. OK, okay. so if you have further questions, please contact us at the booth. We will be there at least uh, until we go to sleep. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah.